In this video, we're going to carry out a mesh convergence. We're going to create a series of mesh studies with increasingly finer mesh. For each study, we will find the peak stress and the number of degrees of freedom in the model. When we are finished, we'll produce a table and a graph to compare. I select Study Advisor and pick a new study. I give the study a name, Mesh 1. This is going to be our courses mesh. I'm just confirming it is a static analysis solution we will be running. That's everything we need to know, so I click the checkbox. The stub settings here are ready to be built upon. First, we want to define a material for the part. I have chosen the default material, alloy steel. I'm using US units of inch, pounds, seconds. I just do a sanity check to see if it's the right value for elastic modulus, Parsons ratio, and density. We can click Apply and then close the dialog box. I can see the material has now been allocated to our part. We don't have any connections in this model, it's just one component. I go to Fixtures and right click. Fixtures define the type of constraint I want to use. We will assume the left hand side is fully built into the ground. The little animation clearly indicates the action of this particular constraint type. Now I just spin the model around slightly to pick that particular face. Click the checkbox and we have our constraint set up. Now I want to apply external loads to the right hand side of the model. I choose a force to apply to the surface. This will effectively be a distributed force over the area. It isn't a, a point force. I pick the surface I want to apply the force to. I can see the other areas highlighting as I hover over them. Now I select the correct face, but I can't right mouse click yet. There's a little bit more to do. I want to set up the value which is 4,000 pounds. Now it's in the wrong direction, so I reverse that. And now it's a pull, not a push. The 4,000 pounds force is used in the training course example where we define a stress concentration factor for this component. The next task is meshing. That really is the focus of this exercise. Let's create the mesh. I want a coarse mesh, so I just move the slider bar all the way over to the coarse mesh indicator. Now if we open up the parameters, we can see what this means numerically. This shows a target element size of 0.44 inches. Now I want a very coarse mesh to start with, so I'm going to overwrite this with a value of 1 inch. This should give me one element through the depth around the whole region. Now I check the box and the mesh is created straight away. If we look at the model, we can see the mesh is very poor. As expected, we see one tet element spanning this complete width from the high stress region across the nominal stress region. If we look inside the mesh, we can see we have a few very flat elements spanning the width. Overall, it looks pretty bad. Let's go ahead anyway and run the study, and it runs very fast indeed. So the maximum von Mises stress from the plot is 14272 psi. Now looking at the plot, the stress distribution doesn't seem to be symmetric about the center line. Now that's a bad result because the geometry, loading and boundary conditions are all symmetric. The elements here are really struggling to get any sense of the stress distribution around the hole. If we spin the model around, we can see the difficulties through the thickness as well, with lack of symmetry. This also highlights how we should be monitoring elements through depth in any 3D model. The surface view can be misleading, so we really need to drill down inside if we can. In the previous video, we compared the default nodal stress result plotting with the optional element stress result plotting. If I select the element type of plotting, the peak has dropped down to 10,962 psi as opposed to 14,272 psi, so a drop of nearly 3,000 psi. If we look underneath the mesh, you can see that the averaging is suffering. The average value is somewhere in the middle of the element, which is attempting to describe a stress distribution across the complete span 
of the geometry. Now it's very harsh to assess element averaging in this way, but it does give a lower bound on convergence. Let's create a new study. The easiest way is to take a duplicate of the first study. Let's call it mesh2, and now we're going to change the mesh. We get a pop-up warning that the results will now be invalid. That's fine, as we will be rerunning. So I go to the mesh parameters and halve the mesh size down to 0.5 of an inch. In other words, double the mesh density. Looking at the model, you can see straight away it's a better looking mesh with two elements through the depth above the hole. It's on its way, it's getting better, but it isn't by any means suitable for a production analysis yet. Let's run this and see what happens. It runs very quickly, and the peak von Mises stress is now 16157 psi, up quite a lot from the 14272 previously. So we can see from this that the coarse mesh is giving us non-conservative stresses, which is dangerous. Our challenge is to see if the stress values have safely converged yet, or are they still dangerously inaccurate. We'd also like to know how big the model is getting. We can find out the model statistics by right-clicking on results to give solvent messages. And we've got just over 7,000 degrees of freedom. Let's carry on with this procedure and duplicate the study to create mesh 3. Again, I halve the mesh size down to 0.25 inches. Now we have four elements through the depth. We can see that in the model. And let's run that again. It still runs quite fast. So looking at the results, the peak stress is now 17.151 psi. So we've upped this about another 1,000 psi from the previous study. The stress distribution is beginning to look a little better. And checking the statistics, we have nearly 40,000 degrees of freedom. Now we don't know if we've actually achieved convergence yet, although we can see we're getting better. So I'm going to repeat the exercise. So here I'm going to remesh and drop the 0.25 inch down to 0.125 inch. This strategy is very crude. It means a rapid increase in the number of degrees of freedom, just successively halving the element size like this. We will see in later videos that we can control the number of elements, and therefore the number of degrees of freedom, in a much more sophisticated way than this. Our goal will be to have very fine local elements around the region of interest and coarser elements away from that stress concentration. Let's run it again. It's slightly slower to run now. So looking at the results, the peak stress is 17396 psi, still drifting up slightly. But if we look at the statistics here, that's a big jump to 220,000 degrees of freedom. So let's see how far we can push this computer with another study, MESH5. I'm halving the element size again to 0 0.0625 inches. Now that took about 19 seconds to mesh, and now you can see an extraordinarily fine mesh. Now it's complete overkill because we've got very fine mesh around the regions we want, but then we've also got very fine mesh around the regions where we just don't need it. If we look on the edge, we can see four elements through the thickness with a nicely regulated pattern. So let's run this analysis. Now that was 22 seconds run time. Interestingly, that's not much more than the meshing time. Loading results is also taking a while now so I really am stretching the computer resource with post-processing as well. That's always a factor in big models. So looking at the results, I have a peak stress, von Mises stress, of 17401 psi. That's just a small fractional increase this time. So it looks like we're certainly achieving convergence. The peak region of stress is well defined within the zone of interest. Now what I'm going to do here is to switch to the element type stress plots.
Remember, these are just a constant average stress in each element. The peak now drops down to 16761 psi, down from 17401 for nodal results. In the limit, as the elements get smaller and smaller, the element and nodes type plots would converge to the same value. However, if I do that, that's a pretty brutal way to confirm mesh convergence. Instead, I'm going to load the nodes plot data into a spreadsheet and see the trend. Let's just check this run statistics on this one. Well, I beat the million degree of freedom mark at 1,290,000 degrees of freedom. As promised, let's summarize the convergence exercise with a graph. Here I plotted the degree of freedom on a log scale to show the convergence better. So now we have peak von Mises stress against numbers of degrees of freedom. We have mesh 1, mesh 2, mesh 3, mesh 4, mesh 5. Now mesh 2 has a 7% error, while mesh 3 is about a 1.5% error. So of these results, mesh 3 is probably the level of accuracy we would like to see but we certainly need a better meshing strategy with fewer degrees of freedom to be efficient. Mesh 4 and 5 really give us no benefit and giving us a huge jump instead in the computing resource we have to apply. So in summary, mesh convergence is always a trade-off between resource and accuracy. It is better to start with a reasonably sized mesh and then refine locally to search for convergence. Starting from a very coarse mesh, as we have done, really doesn't help because there's usually little sign of convergence. The next videos will look at more sophisticated meshing controls so that we can do convergent studies but keep our degree of freedom count right down.